Hi there! This video is part 2 of our PBR texture mapping class, in which you'll learn about the different texture map types you'll find out there, and how you can use them properly in different situations. In the first part, we had a short look at the default texture map types for the PBR workflow, or workflows, <laughs> I'm not making that joke again, and I also slightly introduced you to the concept of materials, shaders, and some basic shader parameters, such as different displacement types. If you got confused by at least one of those words, I heavily recommend watching the first part of this tutorial, because I'm gonna go all out on this one. Now that I gave you enough time to pause this video, you can go ahead and grab a notebook, a pen, and the neurostimulant of your choice, and let's buckle up for the information storm that this video is gonna be. So let's begin. If you've watched the previous video, you probably remember these default map types, and you probably also remember that we only work within the specular workflow. So excuse me while I get the f <laughs> There we go, much better. So each and every single one of these texture types, when imported, needs to be recognized by CryEngine as being exactly the right texture type. We do that by adding a suffix at the end of the name, which is always going to be an underscore, followed by a name tag, which defines the texture type. Now before you get your pitchforks and modded hunt weapons pointing at me, telling me how much extra work that is, let me explain exactly why we do this. While nothing can stop you from just dragging and dropping JPEGs or PNGs into the asset browser, we normally import our textures with the Crytif Exporter, a tool in a Photoshop plugin that you can find in your tools folder in the engine's install location. What this tool does is that it automatically selects a preset as soon as you want to save a specific texture, and will adjust various parameters which will change the way the texture is compiled. And yes, textures are compiled by a part of our engine called the Resource Compiler, or RC. The RC then takes the TIFF files that you import and will transform them into a completely different format called DDS, or Direct Draw Surface. This is a format used by DirectX in order to cram all kinds of data into a single file, which can then be used in real time much, much more efficiently. A part of this data is something that we call MIPS, or MIP maps, which are the equivalent of LODs, except they're used for textures. The number of MIPS states the number of sequences of power of two reductions over the resolution of the original texture, which will then be applied to the surfaces depending on their distance to the camera. We obviously don't need 4K textures on an object in the distance, so... If you export a TIFF texture with a CryTIFF exporter, you'll have all of these settings and more, and in the asset browser, when you double-click a texture that has been imported from a TIFF, all of these settings will become available once again, and the DDS will recompile as soon as you confirm the changes. But again, in order to properly assign these presets automatically, you'll need to export those textures with the right suffix. So let's talk about that now, and let's revise this list once more and add the right suffixes to every one of these texture map types that we see here, and let's also have a look at how we configure these textures for the best performance and visuals. The base color, albedo, or diffuse textures are the first and the simplest on our list, so let's talk about that first, and I promised I'll explain the difference between them in this episode. Plot twist, the difference is that there is no difference between them, at least as long as you don't specify a workflow. All these textures essentially describe a color map, they're just called differently depending on the workflow. Diffuse textures, a term used in the specular workflow, will always represent metals as being entirely black, since reflective metal surfaces do not have a color. Instead, it reflects the color of the environment, just like a mirror. The specular map controls the specular intensity of a surface in this case, so a high specular value will cause the surface to be entirely reflective anyway. The metallic workflow uses a metallic map for that effect, and combined with the base color texture, it allows for a surface to have both color and various levels of specular intensity. By the way, specular means reflective like a mirror, yeah, even the metallic workflow has specular effects, just to be clear, even though that probably made it even more unclear to you. Anyway. The name albedo, however, is not tied to a workflow, and is most often used interchangeably with diffuse and base color. If you want to be 100% correct, the reason why these textures are called the way they are has to do with the way light works in real life. I know, f***ing mind-blowing, right? The term diffuse has to do with the term diffuse coefficient, which determines the color of a pixel when light is reflected diffusely, while albedo normally refers to an average color, often an average over time, which excludes all shadows from the surface. In the real world, a surface may reflect light both diffusely and specularly, but look, the point is, unless you want to be incredibly specific or merely just a smartass like me, any of these three textures will go into this slot and you'll be good to go. Regardless of their original name, the suffix that you will use when saving color maps will be underscore albedo. You might get confused and mistakenly use underscore diffuse, but just albe don't do that. Oh, I'm just gonna go back to making serious videos again. Other surface effects, such as ambient occlusion, which is a texture map itself, can be combined with the albedo texture in order to get some extra detail on the surface. If you ever have an ambient occlusion texture to deal with, you can just drag the albedo map into Photoshop, followed by the AO map, and then you can select the AO layer and you can choose the multiply modifier. And now, your surface will have a little extra, well, fake, shadow information to display. 
Since the diffuse textures are always the one who get rendered first, there's also another special trick that these textures can do. In the last video, I explained how pictures are formed of three different channels of color information. Haha, <laughs> we didn't unlock the fourth one yet. <laughs> Hell yeah, we did. And it's called the alpha layer channel. It's called the alpha channel. Uh, Brian's gonna skin me alive if I make that mistake again. Every single one of these channels can only retain grayscale information, and most file formats will only have a maximum of three different channels, which is the standard for the RGB color model. However, there are image formats such as PNG or TIFF, which feature the possibility of having an extra channel of information called the alpha channel. Normally, this one's designed to retain information about transparency in an image, but in case of digital artists, that's just free real estate. <laughs> but yes, we also use it for transparency, but alpha channels can also do much more than that. In case of albedo textures, we use the alpha channel the way it was intended originally, for transparency. Filling the alpha layer with a... Did I say layer? Filling the alpha channel with an opacity mask will allow the surface to have various levels of transparency and allow you to create semi-transparent objects such as grass and leaves for example. These textures are saved under the preset albedo with opacity, which usually happens automatically, and use the exact same underscore albedo suffix like any other diffuse texture. The level of opacity, varying from black to white, can also be controlled via the alpha test slider in the cryingy material, which will change the contrast of the opacity mask and allow you to control fine details in the texture. Next off we have the normal map and the gloss map, and as you might remember from the previous video, these two go very well together. As I previously said, alpha channels offer more than just the ability to store transparency, and as you can see, we have a specific slot for every texture in the material editor. Except for gloss maps. Gloss maps, when available, will always go into the alpha channel of the normal maps, and will change the way the normal maps are treated by the renderer. When saving a normal map without any gloss map in its alpha, we will save it with the suffix underscore ddn, and the TIFF exporter will automatically recognize it as a normal map. However, when you save a normal map with a gloss map in its alpha, we use the suffix underscore ddna, with an a for alpha, if it makes it easier for you to remember it, and then the normals with smoothness preset, which is normally automatically assigned. The gloss parameter, or strength, is controlled by the smoothness slider in CryEngine, and just like in the case of the specular, if you don't have a gloss map together with a normal, the slider will just apply a uniform level of smoothness to the entire surface, not making any difference between areas of high gloss versus areas of glow, 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 glow loss, low gloss. God damn it, that was difficult. Well, I know myself well enough to know I'm gonna keep that in. Next off we have the specular maps, which are extremely simple. Just drag your texture into Photoshop, go to File, Save As, and save it with the Creative plugin and the suffix underscore spec. There isn't much you can do to these textures, so that's pretty much it. If you're converting the specular map of some known reflective surface, such as a rock, sometimes you might be prompted by a window saying that your specular map is too dark and maybe you want to go back and fix it yourself. You might, however, also know that that's the freaking point, so you just gotta have to click the button that's the closest equivalent to I don't give up and you're good to go. The specular intensity is controlled by the specular multiplier in CryEngine, and if you don't use a specular texture, the renderer will just take the color you give it and apply it uniformly to the surface. If you use a specular map, you should not leave your specular color on black, otherwise the multiplier will just multiply everything by zero and... y'all who finished middle school probably know what that means. Therefore, values between dark grey and white will be kind of what you're looking for. You can tweak things around until your surface looks good. Displacement textures are also extremely simple, since all you gotta do is to save them with the underscore dispel underscore d-i-s-p-l Nah, dispel sounds better. All you gotta do is to save them with the underscore dispel suffix, which stands for displacement. Duh. Now that you know how to save and use all of these, allow me to reintroduce you to, uh... Come here, boy. Come on. Come here. Come here. Alright, get up. It's time to talk about the metallic to specular workflow conversion, and it's not actually that difficult, but you need to understand a couple of things about it first. Metallic and roughness are both black and white textures. They can't contain color, and they also shouldn't. Metals don't reflect their own color, they reflect the color of the environment. But in the specular workflow, specular maps aren't only used for metals, they're used for everything. And things do reflect color, obviously. So if you were to use a metallic map as a specular, not only would the values be mathematically speaking, absolutely up the f they would also not reflect any color at all, which is not what we want. So the way we deal with this is by dragging our color map into Photoshop first, and this is where we'll get our color information from. Then we'll drag the metallic map in there as well, and I'll create a new fill layer, which I'll then use as a layer mask for our metallic texture. With this layer selected, I'm going to press Shift F5, and then I will fill this new layer with a nice neutral gray color of 38 38 38, which is neutral enough to give us the specular results we want. Then, I'm going to click on this button which says Add Layer Mask, and I'll click the metallic map layer, press Ctrl and A to select it all, and then copy the whole thing and paste it right into the mask I just created. 
Now you can press Ctrl D to deselect it, and then I'm going to invert the mask with Ctrl I. Then I'll just select the main metallic layer with the mask, and we'll choose the Multiply modifier. The reason why we did all of this is because we want to multiply the color information of our albedo texture with the inverted reflective information of the metallic map. Now you can save this texture with the underscore spec suffix, because you've essentially just created the specular map you wanted. In case of the roughness map, things are much much simpler. Just drag your roughness map into Photoshop, press Ctrl I to invert it, and that's your gloss map. It's as simple as that. Now if I press Ctrl I again, bam, now it's a roughness map. Now it's gloss. Now it's roughness. Now it's gloss. Now it... Uh, I don't even know anymore. Once you've inverted the roughness map, you can just copy it and paste it right into the alpha of the normal map and save it as your DDNA texture. So those are pretty much the rules you need to know in order to import the standard PBR textures into CryEngine, and while there are more texture map types out there, such as detail maps and emission maps, it would be way too much info to just cram into one video, so I'll leave some links to the documentation down in the description where you can learn more about these case-by-case -case situations. If you still want to see those situations in a video, let us know, and we might make another tutorial talking about these special cases in particular. Now that we got that out of the way, let's get back to the beautiful subject of PBR as a whole and how some of these effects are achieved and what your choices are when choosing the right technology. Reflections on the surfaces of objects, as well as the ambient colors that the surfaces reflect, heavily depend on the lighting conditions as well as the surroundings. That means that the surfaces can look completely different depending on weather, the objects around them, the different lighting settings in the scenes they're in, and so on. The real-time rendering engines we have today only render what's in front of you. We call that screen space. Whatever is outside of the screen space will literally not exist for some of the processes in your GPU. In order for these objects to know what's around them, they need to use all the rendered information they have available and to project that frame data as a reflection coming from the surface of an object. This particular technique is called SSR and it stands for Screen Space Reflections. This means that whatever is in the screen space will be used by all reflective surfaces in the screen space. Notice the repetition? Yep, this has some problems. Although there are multiple ways that SSR can be achieved, all methods have one major flaw. The screen space part. In reality, when you see the reflection of an object, or even the object itself, obviously, all the rays of light that your brain perceives need to come directly towards you and punch you right in the retina. Basic geometry can show you that, even though a good part of what's in the screen space can still be used as reflective information, a lot of the parts that need to be reflected are not in the screen space. And this is exactly why you'll always notice these type of reflections changing in pretty much every game that uses SSR. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, then what's this? Wait, what? Also, what the hell is this? How can this be reflected? This ain't in the screen space. This is what's called a reprojection effect. And it happens because the screen space is also in the screen space, if that makes any sense. So some parts that get reflected might re-reflect into themselves due to the camera angle. Another cute feature that you'll notice in some games if you pay attention. How do we fix this? Yeah, we will. You can try and hide this effect by tweaking some SSR parameters in the editor, but since this is a limitation of the technology, you can't do much about it yet. Hunt did a pretty good job at hiding it, but you can still see it at the tip of some weapons or in some special situations. Also, this is called a cube map, and it's the main reason why I'm telling you all this. A cube map is also a texture often used in the PBR pipeline to allow surfaces to reflect the environment around you. It's a 360 degree image, which is usually taken during production in the editor and will allow the reflective surfaces to suddenly you know, reflect what's behind them. Ray tracing will be an absolute game changer for the way we calculate reflections, which is why I'm personally really looking forward to it, but guess who doesn't? But light doesn't just reflect from the surfaces of objects, it also goes through them, sometimes. This effect is called SSS and it's normally used in all kinds of situations such as vegetation, skin, getting your video demonetized on YouTube, and so on. Stands for subsurface scattering, and it's another special case which has many different applications. It's mainly controlled by a texture called an SSS map, and it's something that we'll talk about in more detail in a future tutorial. Another thing that I should mention are the ways in which light propagates through space. This is actually pretty cool, because it's a technology that only recently made its way into games. This comes in the form of global illumination, or sparse voxel octree global illumination in CryEngine's case, and it's not just the light propagation that the system takes into account, it also deals with the propagation of color. As you might know, color is simply just the vibration frequency of the light, which changes when hitting certain surfaces. My good friend Brian has an awesome tutorial on the topic of Sfoggy, so I'll let him explain the rest. The main idea of this technology is that instead of using rays to trace where light might propagate, we're instead voxelizing the entire scene around you. That way, we can use the diffuse color information in the textures of the objects that are hit by direct or indirect light, and we can propagate that light and color information to nearby surfaces around them. 
Of course, the effects you're seeing right now are a bit exaggerated for the purpose of this demonstration, but you get the point. All these techniques combined are able to replicate the way light behaves in reality to a pretty decent extent. Our journey of replicating reality is far from over though, but I mean, we're getting there. So stay tuned as we continue to disassemble current workflows and try to explain why we do things the way we do them. If you have any extra questions, make sure to head over to our Discord server, where you can talk to us, the CryEngine developers, and where you can get professional advice on your own little journey of playing God in your living room. I'll see you there. On Discord, not in your living room, obviously.